Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for CMSMC's um, symposium, History Should Make You Uncomfortable. Uh, for those of us who have joined before, you might recognize this theme. It's actually the theme that our first symposium covered and one of the first topics that sort of brought us together as a platform. Um, my name is Sydney Sheehan, and I'm the creative director of CMSMC. Before I continue with my opening remarks, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and honor the fact that I'm presenting from Haudenosaunee territory, specifically on Ganya Gahaga or Mohawk Nation land, um, an area today known as New York State. For those of you who don't know, the Coalition of Master Scholars on Material Culture, or CMSMC, is a platform born online dedicated to helping emerging and established master scholars by providing a space to publish their work and contribute to the expanding field of material culture. CMSMC was created after we ourselves experienced the difficulties facing those with a master's degree in fields relating to material culture, especially during the pandemic. Funding, jobs, and other opportunities were and still are scarce. Our platform is not associated with any university or institution and is run by fellow ma master scholars for master scholars. And officially, we are now a 501c3 nonprofit. Our online publication is similar to an undergraduate review, and we aim to fill a gap for those earning or possessing a master's degree. These scholars, often emerging scholars, are competing with doctoral students or established academics for publication in other journals. In the two years that our site has been live, we've published almost 70 articles with more in the works. We've had almost 40,000 unique readers on our website, and we've hosted many previous symposiums, uh, professional development events, and other get-togethers. If you're wondering about ways to get involved or support CMSMC, we have several opportunities for you. You can make a tax deductible donation via DonorBox. Uh, you can find that on our website. We also have a store on our website where we're currently selling custom merchandise and apparel, including our History Should Make You Uncomfortable merch. We're completely funded by support by readers and viewers like you. Um, and any financial contribution is always extremely appreciated and helps support our mission. We also encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter um, to stay updated on our future symposiums, professional development events, networking events, and publications. And all of this, of course, can be found on our website, which we encourage you to uh, check out after this symposium. For our 2023 symposium, we have returned to our inaugural theme, history should make you uncomfortable. By asserting that history should make you uncomfortable, we are insisting that there's more to the story that you think you know. This theme also asks scholars and the public alike not just to approach the subject with a critical eye, but to think about why these uncomfortable histories that we know to exist have not breached mainstream understandings of the world. It calls into question authority and visibility in the historical record, and asks learners to question why it is we learn the things we do. By recentering these marginalized and often uncomfortable histories, our capacity to learn grows exponentially, not just as individuals, but societally. Finally, history should make you uncomfortable. Simply put, insists that the learning process should not necessarily be an easy or a comfortable one. That is not to say that learning should not be a positive experience, but rather that an effective tool in learning is discomfort. There's always a level of discomfort attached when one is faced with a new idea or experienced, yet it is pushing through that feeling of discomfort that personal growth is found. Yet at times discomfort can be counterproductive, as we will hear from one of our speakers today. However, it's often through discomfort that one can learn to be a better learner. However, um, it is for this reason and so many more that history should make you uncomfortable. We will continue ex to explore this theme with an upcoming round of publications. CMSMC has traditionally published bi-weekly during the academic year, but we are now moving towards a more traditional journal style with a more concentrated publication. We hope to publish special issues around um upcoming symposium topics, and our first issue will center around the theme of history should make you uncomfortable. Our call for papers for this issue is now live on our website, and we will share a link directly in the chat. We encourage submissions with a due date of June 1st. 
And now it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce our panelists for today's symposium. Our first speaker is Caroline Marcies. Um, Caroline will start our morning off with their presentation titled The Origin of the World, an analysis of the female nude through Gustave Courbet, Courbet's infamous masterpiece is a case study of the 1866 painting. Caroline will use the painting as an example to understand what makes female nudity in art such a controversial topic and how women are treated in art and by artists from the 19th century to modern day. She is a second year student at the Material Culture and Public Humanities Master's Program at Virginia Tech. Her areas of focus include museum administration, community outreach programming, and museum accessibility. Caroline hopes to enter the museum administration field upon graduation in May of 2023. Next, we'll hear from Dorian Cole. Dorian will present Play Things Teaching Systematic Prejudice Through Children's Toys, a case study of two objects from the Winterthur Museum, an iron puppet of a black man and a cloth topsy-turvy doll. Using these two toys as an example, they will discuss the way toys are used to normalize systemic racism in the minds of children, and also how this is not reflected in the way these objects are presented in, museum, in museums. Dorian is a Lois F. McNeil Fellow with the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. They graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from UC Berkeley in 2022 with a BA in, in History and English. Their current research interests include the material history of popular culture and museum visitor studies. We will then have a presentation from Lyric Lot entitled, Who Are Museums For? Plan Robes and the po Politics of Discomfort in the Exhibit Space. This presentation will dis discuss the utility of discomfort as a tool of education and the problems it can create within exhibit spaces. Focusing on the display of Ku Klux Klan robes, this presentation will explore the balancing act museums must make between the education of the public and the stewardship of traumatizing materials. Lyric holds an MPhil in early modern history from the University of Cambridge and is, current, is a current fellow in the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture at the University of Delaware. In her studies, she researches difficult objects or pieces of material culture that present problematic histories or provenances. Then we will have a retrospective about our very first symposium with two scholars, Christine Staten and Logan Ward. Christine has an MA in art history from Syracuse University with a focus on Italian early modern art history. As a master's scholar, Christine studied the revival of Egyptian antiquities in late 16th century Rome. She now teaches art history at Rowan University. While a master's student, Christine spoke at the inaugural symposium of CMSMC and delivered a paper entitled Curating Heritage Value, the Palazzo Strozzi and Florence. This paper explored the foundation of the Palazzo Strozzi Museum in Florence, Italy during the fascist era in Italy and the early years of the Second World War. Although this history is widely available to the interested reader, the public information that the museum provides ignores its entirety or ignores it entirely, excuse me. Christine's paper focuses the, on the discomfort that the museum clearly felt with its own history and how it contributed to the creation of a specifically Italian cultural heritage. Logan Ward is a PhD student in art history, focusing on Korean art at the University of Kansas. Their research interests include Korean art collections in the United States and modern contemporary art and visual culture in and from both North and South Korea with emphases on post-coloniality and semiotics. Ward teaches modern Korean art and culture at Kansas University, um, and he has been an editor for the CMSMC since 2021. They delivered their first paper titled Double Orientalized Korea, at History Should Make You Uncomfortable in 2020, which served as a basis for their first MA thesis titled Colonial Conne Connections, Interpreting and Representing Korea Through Art and Material Culture at the Cleveland Museum of Art at the Ohio State University. Following the retrospective, we'll have a Q&A session with all of our panelists. Um, and before we continue, I would like to say a huge thank you to our symposium committee, Perry Buke, Christine Staten, Reb Zhu, Molly Radford, Sarah Henslake, and Mary Manfredi, without whom this symposium would absolutely not have been possible. Um, and so without further ado, here is Caroline Marcies.
Good morning. Uh, within the world of art, the female nude is a common subject material found in museum collections across the globe. One such example is Gustave Courbet's The Origin of the World, painted in 1866. This oil on canvas is currently housed in the Musée d'Orsay in France. <clears throat> French artist Gustave Courbet's take on the female nude in this painting is famous due to its mysterious disappearance from the public eye for the majority of the 20th century, as well as its potentially profane subject material. This presentation aims to take a closer look at the origin of the world in order to better understand what makes female nudity in art such a controversial topic and open a larger awareness of how women are treated in art and by artists during the 19th century. Touching on context and theoretical lenses, this presentation argues that museums should evaluate how exploitative works such as Gustave Courbet's The Origin of the World should be displayed and interpreted in the modern day. Through several compositional factors, the viewer's eye is led to the genitals as the focal point of the origin of the world. The presence of pubic hair, unique in this transgressive work, serves as a dark color against a light skin tone and also leads the eye to the figure's obscured genitalia. In addition, less detailed attention is paid to the torso of the figure and the garment in comparison to the lower half of the figure, indicating Corbet's intention to have the exposed genitals as the, as the focal point of the origin of the world. One can assume that Corbet intends to suggest the female genitalia is the origin of the world. Briefly, it is insightful to discuss the exigence of the work. Gustave Courbet was a French artist born in Ornans in the 19th century and was quite famous during his lifetime. In rising to fame, Courbet followed the examples of contemporaneous writers in garnering the attention of the press with artworks that pushed the boundaries of acceptability. Author of The Most Arrogant Man in France, Petra Tindusgate Chu, claims that Courbet purposefully created work that elicited a maximum amount of discussion. Courbet intended his works to be outlandish and controversial. The Origin of the World is an excellent example of Courbet using artwork to garner press attention. Furthering the historical context, it is important to note that this piece was commissioned. Turkish Egyptian diplomat Khalil Bey moved to France in the early 1860s and collected artwork from famous French artists of the time. Originally, Khalil Bey had attempted to acquire another hotly debated piece by Courbet, Venus and Psyche. When the Venus and Psyche painting was sold to another, Courbet promised Khalil Bey that he would paint two works for the collector, The Sleepers and The Origin of the World. Given the already transgressive status of Venus and Psyche as a lesbian depiction, it is evident that Khalil Bey wanted paintings equally as scandalous. Both artist and collector alike wanted artwork that would be discussed in the press, furthering the fame of both individuals as well as the work itself. Talk they did, the press as well as the public. An excellent example of public reaction is found in Léonce Petty's cartoon, Gustave Courbet in Lahanatin. Published in 1867, the image features a caricature of Courbet surrounded by his famous works. Of note, above the figure's left shoulder is an image of a fig leaf instead of the origin of the world. This choice is interesting because another nude artwork next to the figure's right hand has not been omitted. This cartoon is indicative of the reaction to the painting at the time. The origin of the world was so scandalous it could not be caricatured, but rather had to be substituted in media. What makes the origin of the world surpass the boundaries of art into the territory of transgression? First, it is the angle and the framing of the piece. Consider Albrecht Durer's The Draftsman Drawing the Nude. Traditional nude artworks feature the figure depicted from a reclined lengthwise posture. This can also be seen in Edward Manet's Olympia, another nude artwork contemporaneous to Courbet. In both The Draftsman and Olympia, the face of the figure is included and the genitalia is covered. The origin presents the genitalia of the figure as a focal point, dramatically shifting the angle of the figure and even omitting the face and most of the body. The cho this choice by Courbet to go against traditional nude representations is shocking. Courbet is objectifying and focusing on the genitalia to garner public attention. Second, another scandalous facet of the origin of the world is the presence of pubic hair. It is uncommon to see pubic hair in the traditional female nude in this period, in commenting on the, press, the presence of transgressive body hair in his study of Manet's Olympia, art historian T.J. Clark writes, hair, so the textbooks say, is a secondary sexual characteristic. In the nude, however, it is a prime signifier of sex. Plenty of it in the right places is delightful and feminine. Pubic hair, need it be said, 
may hide the lack of the phallus, but is somehow too close to being that lack, which is why it cannot be shown. And hair is disallowed for some reason in all manner of other places. Pubic hair, classical, classical tr tradition suggests, is not feminine and therefore should be omitted in artworks. Corbet does not follow this rule, again serving to make this work transgressive and scandalous. This presentation now turns to the once long-standing tradition of hiding or veiling this work. The origin of the world from the time of its creation until it was acquired by the Musée d'Orsay in 1995 was hidden from regular viewing in at least three ways. The first was by Khalil Bey himself. It was reported that the Turkish diplomat kept the work in his bathroom behind a green curtain, similar to Renaissance practices of veiling artworks. Maxime Ducamp wrote about seeing the origin of the world in Khalil Bey's home in his book, The Convulsions of Paris. In the toilet of the foreign personage I have alluded to, one saw a small painting under a green veil. Lifting the veil, one was stupefied to see a life-size woman in frontal view, extraordinarily convulsively aroused, remarkably painted. There is a word for people capable of this kind of filth, referring to Corbet, but I shall not pronounce it for the reader, it being one only used in the butchering trade. This technique of hiding the work for selective viewing furgues the argument of the work as transgressive, but also suggests a secretive connotation to seeing the painting. One required the express permission of the owner to view the piece, and it was then unveiled and revealed to the viewer in a mysterious, secretive fashion. After Khalil Bey sold his collection in 1868, the painting went missing from the public eye, but was rediscovered in the shop of Antoine de Lenard in 1889. In this iteration of hiding, the origin of the world was covered by another painting, Chateau de Blonay, also by Courbet. From at least 1889 into the mid 20th century, Courbet's infamous work was kept under lock and key by a much more outwardly acceptable work of Courbet's. Rather than publicly display the transgressive work, perhaps the owner after Khalil Bey wanted to be able to privately enjoy the piece without judgment or knowledge of its whereabouts. This new hiding method again continues the same mysterious circumstances in which the origin of the world was allowed to be viewed. The third and final known method for hiding the origin of the world was concocted by famed psychoanalyst and art collector Jacques Lacan. Upon acquiring the work in 1954, Lacan and his wife, Sylvia Bataille, commissioned artist André Masson to paint a wooden panel to hide the piece. The cover, referred to as Terre Erotique, features a surrealist landscape formed by tracing the contours of the underlying courbet. The cover still veils the transgressive piece, but suggests its scandalous form underneath. Once one has seen the underlying work, it is easy to recognize the same shapes repeated in the mass and cover. In his account of seeing the origin of the world at Lacan's home, author James Lord wrote, After lunch, we were escorted into a small building, which was Lacan's studio. My companion whispered to me, he's going to show us his courbet. To the right of the doorway, in a heavy gilt frame, hung an abstract painting by Masson. The Masson was painted on a thin pane that slipped out of the frame, revealing a detailed, magnificently executed, close-up of the genitals of a plump, almost obese woman. The secret of fashion in which the painting is discussed, as well as the grand method employed by Lacan in unveiling the piece to his guests, once again suggests strange secretive contexts in which the painting was viewed and kept. When the origin of the world was on public view in the Musée d'Orsay in 1995, all coverings were removed. The painting was, and continues to be, hung on the wall uncovered for all to see. Curator Dominique de font commented on the choice of the museum to display the piece uncovered, arguing, the origin of the world ceased to be something secret and sacred, becoming once again a canvas nothing can render banal. Gone were the veils intended to hide the work. The scandal was once again known and available to the public. It is with this shift in mind that we turn to a theoretical analysis of the work as it has been displayed in the past, as well as how it is displayed today. Laura Mulvey's visual pleasure and narrative cinema is the cornerstone of this interrogation of the origin of the world as an objectifying work through Mulvey's concept of the male gaze. In her essay, Mulvey asserts, in a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. Mulvey observes a trend wherein the male observer is catered to by sexually available and possessable female characters, styled to pleasure the male observer. The origin of the world is a particularly striking example of catering to the male gaze. The viewer of the work identifies with the male gaze, and the female nude is objectified. She is anonymous, and thus her private areas are available for claim. 
The viewer can, in effect, possess the female genitalia Corbet presents to his audience. The work creates and fosters an intimacy with the viewer that encourages both possession and objectification. The theory of the male gaze can be furthered by theorist Linda Henschel's pornotopic techniques of the observer, which identifies the act of sight as inherently a sexual act. The gaze aims to penetrate the depicted genitalia of Corbet's nude. As such, looking becomes essentially pornographic. Pornography does not begin where the visibility of the body in the art of linear perspective ends. It is rather the other way around. Linear perspective keeps working at this mysterious place where the pornographic pleasures for visual penetration reaches its limits. While the viewer can't physically see inside the nude woman's genitals, the gaze aims to penetrate and imagine what the inside of the figure's private areas would look like. The, con the connections to the male gaze are clear. Corbet's infamous masterpiece objectifies the female body for the pleasure of the male viewer. The practice of covering the work of the male owner controlling who sees the work and when shows perhaps that the male owners were in control of who got to see her unveiled. The covering behavior becomes an act of displaying power, of objectification and possession, and of sexual pleasure limited to those who were deemed worthy to witness the painting. Historian Catherine McCormack argues that work of this type is an admittance that looking and who gets to look and make art is more about power and control than we, we might first be inclined to think. It is about who gets to tell their version of the story and who makes an object out of whom. It is evident that the origin of the world uses the female body as an object to please the male gaze. Through overt objectification, sexualization, and penetration, the body is mutilated and separated from any identity to simplify it as a piece of male pleasure. However, is leaving the work uncovered in a museum any better than the secretive covering of the artwork in the past? McCormack argues no. Seeing these images in their heavy gilded frames, tenderly lit and guarded by tasseled ropes and attentive guards, somehow makes male desire and violence both precious and part of the unquestionable natural order of things. By placing artwork such as Gustave Courbet's The Origin in places of honor such as the Musée d'Orsay, the violence and power and balance these artworks testify to is further solidified in sociocultural norms. Continuing to privileges, privilege these works normalizes the violence they encourage. McCormack continues, many of these images objectify women, normalize violence against them, stereotype or exclude racial diversity, or demonize aging and non-normative bodies and sexualities. This uh, presentation argues that artworks with violent and abusively sexualizing connotations, such as the origin of the world, should be both alarming and problematic to a modern museum. As issues of diversity and representation in museums become ever more pressing, Having inherently patriarchal and violent images is not a good look for museums who continue to display them. McCormack notes that often it is hard to enact this kind of change in a museum setting, saying that the, the walls of our galleries have a sacrosanct charge that absorbs any censure, but that does not mean change is beyond possible or unnecessary. Theorist Linda Need argues that the boundaries between art and pornography continue to shift and to raise complex issues for feminist cultural and sexual politics. It is apparent that debates about how to display or interpret works such as the origin are ongoing. In raising awareness of the problematic nature of the origin of the world, this presentation intends to jumpstart the difficult conversation about whether these works deserve a place of honor in a museum, in museum halls today, or whether museums should reconsider displaying them. The origin of the world encourages a sexual viewing and possessive objectification of the female nude, and museums, as influencer as influencers of public thought and discourse should consider problematizing works of this type within their collections. Columnist Holland Carter argues, increasingly a lot of older art, if it's going to be alive for new audiences, will need to be presented from these dual perspectives as formerly superlative creations, but also as containers of difficult, often negative histories. Put plainly, women deserve more respect in the artistic medium than they are afforded in Corbet's The Origin of the World. Holland Carter insists that we can love art for its beauties and call it out for its blindness. We can exalt it to the skies and still wrestle it to the ground. Old or new, art is us at our best and our worst, and it really is us with everything that means and useful beyond fashion or price. Museums play a role in changing that narrative and giving power back to women through fighting domination of the male gaze. Artworks that celebrate male domination over women must be interpreted from a modern ethic, and the problematic nature of the origin of the world should be recognized and evaluated. Thank you.
Hello. I'm Dorian and I'm sharing my screen. Okay, amazing. <laughs> All right. So minstrelsy was a distinctly American development, with some even calling it the first truly American form of popular culture. And the performances grew to include a pantheon of stock characters. And these stock characters, they still lurk in the background of our history. Blackface caricature can even appear where we do not expect it within child toys, often presented as entirely innocent diversions. Now, as material culturalists strive to understand the impacts and effects of play objects, we must prove what most parents already know. Toys are more than toys. They impart meaning. If every doll speaks to the child it plays with, then what exactly is it saying? I want to start with a content warning. The following presentation describes the maintenance of systemic racism through material culture objects depicting racial stereotypes. And as such, it will include images of blackface, objects that reproduce racist caricature, and um, as well as the names and descriptions of specific minstrel stock characters. Given the goal and subject of this conference, I felt it was necessary to provide these images to better highlight and deconstruct their lineages. Now, history will make you uncomfortable but I do not want this presentation to be re-traumatizing for anyone. So please feel free to step out if you need to and make sure to take care of yourself. I'll be using three major concepts borrowed from Robin Bernstein's 2011 book, Racial Innocence in this presentation. The first of which is racial innocence, which describes how children are inculcated through scripted actions into the beliefs that support systemic racism, causing them to grow up understanding those beliefs to be an unquestionable truth. Now, basically, this is the principle that if you grow up playing games like Cowboys and Indians, you're not going to question that Manichaean dichotomy. You're going to believe that it's the natural state of the world. Then we have scriptive things, the idea that some objects prescribe a use or action through their materiality. And a great example of this is the Jack in the Box. We can tell what the object wants us to do just by looking at it. And it provides haptic feedback that encourages us as well, right? And finally, we have the transgressive script. Now, this is an action that is not intended by the object's creator, but suggested by the object's materiality nevertheless. For instance, prying open that jack-in-the-box to get a look at what's inside. All right, now that we've hopefully got those terms under our belt, we can move forward into two case studies. The first is the Iron Puppet. One of the stock characters of minstrelsy was the coon caricature, originating from American slavery, but increasingly identified with young urban black men in the Jim Crow era. This caricature depicted black men as lazy and clumsy, and in the minstrel show, it took on a comedic aspect. In shows set post-emancipation, the coon was dressed as a dandy with his top hat and waistcoats, indicating a kind of illusion of grandeur. The comedic buffoonery of the character was illustrated through erratic movement of his limbs and other forms of early slapstick comedy like falling down. And these movements were even translated into dancing acts that involves contorted motions, white actors twisting their legs and arms in a manner they claimed was authentic to black culture. However, the caricatures of minstrelsy, minstrelsy were drawn, of course, not from black culture, but from white anxiety about race. The minstrel show reaffirmed the narratives of white supremacy but its existence also indicates that those narratives needed a constant maintenance to survive. Bernstein's racial innocence then can be seen as part of that maintenance, building the childhood foundations of the narratives white supremacy depended on for its existence. The Winterter collection houses an object that has been simply labeled toy in the museum archives, though the toy in question captures this history of anti-black caricature. The accession records indicate that the toy has undergone several name changes in its time at Winterter and was originally labeled monkey. Now, while I won't speculate too much about the origins of that mislabeling, the mistake makes the derogatory associations this toy is intended to evoke very clear. The toy consists of a flat sheet of tinned iron cut to look like a man's torso with jointed arm and leg pieces that swing freely. Now, the handle attached to the figure's head with a thick iron wire allows it to bounce when held aloft, and it causes the illusion that the figure is walking or dancing. The clothing the toy is painted in mimics the dress of a young dandy archetype, but the man's racialized appearance, the face is left unpainted, right, to show dark iron, and the silhouette is cut to emphasize his protruding stomach, nose, and lips. This identifies the toy with that post-emancipation dandified zip coon caricature. In the next slide, I'm going to show an image of this toy side by side with that zip coon caricature so that you can note the similarity before we proceed. 
Thomas D. Rice was the first uh, white actor to don blackface in a minstrel show, allegedly. Um, and I think that the similarities in these two images sort of speak for themselves, and I don't want to dwell on the caricature itself too long. Within this context, right, the toy's intended scripted action takes on a new meaning. The toy is a walking man, and it's intended to be held by its handle to mimic walking, but the manner in which it walks evokes the problematic physical humor of minstrelsy. Now you can see in the image on the right where I've recreated the toy from paper what this walking action looks like. The toy is amusing because its limbs jet out to strike funny poses, and its legs can collapse in a tangle where they touch the ground. Now paired with this toy's visual references to anti-black caricature, the exaggerated walk reproduces the stereotype of the clumsy black dandy depicted in minstrel shows. Walking men toys often depicted similarly caricature, caricatured black men, but they were created for toddlers. And thus in play, the toy duplicates the narrative of minstrel shows, but for that extremely young audience. With its intended scripted action and the resulting movement, the toy asks toddlers to believe in the same racial stereotypes created to ease the racial anxieties of their parents. Black men who dress like refined gentlemen are only playing a part, and they are playing it poorly. The toy says to the toddler, you should laugh. This is deserving of ridicule. Our second case study, the topsy-turvy doll, is a little bit more nuanced than the first. As opposed to the Iron Puppet's very straightforward replication of minstrelsy, there are several different potential interpretations for the meaning imparted by this doll's scripted action. Now that being said, the doll definitely naturalizes ideas about the antebellum South that existed in the white imagination as both gendered and racialized constructions of a hierarchical social order by recreating an idealized relationship between the manly archetype and the white child that she takes care of. One 1896 article describes these dolls as having the face of a child on one end, and when turned down the other had the face of the old black mammy. Now likewise, Winneter's topsy-turvy dolls, created by the Bruckner Company, were advertised as reversible Negro mammy and white novelty dolls. Thus, through their imagery, these dolls reinscribed an image of the Old South as a prosperous wonderland, wherein slavery was essentially familial. Also, for the topsy-turvy doll to function properly as a doll in play, the child must flip over its dress to cover one of its two faces. And this element of the doll suggests a narrative of dominance rather than contact, of difference rather than integration. In conjunction with the visual language of the mammy and the white child that she cares for, this narrative teaches the little girls who play with these dolls that racial hierarchy is both natural and also necessary. Now, due to the population popularity, sorry, of Uncle Tom's Cabin and the shared names between the doll and Stowe's caricature of a young black girl, Topsy, Topsy Turvy Dolls, they gained the alternate moniker Topsy Ava Dolls. This name suggested that the doll depicted the relationship between free wealthy white children and enslaved black children rather than a mammy figure. Now, Topsy too traces her origins from min minstrelsy, replicating the trope of a wild, uncontrollable black child. Within the novel, Topsy and Ava are literary doubles. They're juxtaposed against each other to show the ill effects of slavery on a child. While Ava is the good white uh, Christian child who upon her death ascends to heaven, Topsy is depicted as undisciplined and immoral. And yet the two form a close relationship. And after Ava's death, Topsy resolves to change her behavior. The story suggests very paternalistically that with the help of a white little girl, a black little girl can become her equal. And thus the doll's ability to flip from white to black suggests that metaphorically a topsy can become an Ava. But even if the message is something approaching equality, the focus on changing from black to white on the idea of becoming white only reinscribes prejudice about skin culture or skin color. That being said, we see the opposite narrative reflected in the rhymes that the dolls are advertised with. So we see first I'm white, then I'm black. And then in the other one, presto change, She's black as night. In both these rhymes, the doll moves from white to black and not the other way around. And thus the scripted action is to flip the doll only in this direction, from white to black. Now this reflects a presto changeo narrative that became an entire genre in early cinema. Film historian Susan Courtney places this genre between the years 1903 and 1908. Films like The Haunted Curiosity Shop produced a presto changeo effect by cutting between shots of a white actor and that same actor in blackface. Meanwhile, this 1903 example, called What Happened in the Tunnel, 
depicts a white couple canoodling while the white woman's black maid sits next to her on the train. The train runs through a tunnel, and when they emerge, the white man is kissing the black maid. He recoils in shock and disgust while the two women laugh to each other, clearly having played this joke on him together. In all of the films of this type, a presumed horror of the switch from white to black skin is at the center. However, in this example, the white and black women are surprisingly on equal ground, sharing agency in this trick, even as the trick itself is still othering. And likewise, though it attempts to reassure its audience of legible racial difference by visualizing how easy a switch like this could really be, this genre of films kind of undermines its own point. It highlights similarity instead of difference. The same implications of racial switching are at work in this topsy-turvy doll, but the construction of the doll also locates the black character and white character within the same body. The construction of the doll suggests something subversive, that would have become clear as a child played with it. The white and black characters are literally connected at the hip. The doll's construction was the novelty that provided its selling point in advertising, and therefore the doll invites the transgressive script in addition to its intended ones. With its skirt pulled down, the doll might suggest a racial hierarchy, but if a child lifts that skirt, they can easily imagine the doll as two connected characters interacting with each other, adding a humanizing aspect to the doll's play narrative. And in fact, when this doll was displayed by the Winterthur Museum, it was positioned so that its skirt was flipped always, revealing both faces to the visitors who encountered it. And in this position, visitors discovered what the children who played with it must have known as well. Difference is only a matter of perspective. Now, that brings me to my final point. Having now explored the many significances of these two toys, one might imagine the interpretive potential they have in the museum space when approached delicately. Unfortunately, the topsy-turvy doll lives in storage, and while the iron puppet is on display, it lacks any label. And this is in part a struggle of the house museum model, which prioritizes creating spaces that appear lived in over content curation. But when an item like this exists as a toy like any other, just sitting on a table without context next to other toys, it does the same duplicitous damage it was kind of always intended to do. It reproduces the depiction of black men in minstrel shows and normalizes the ownership of a toy intended to prescribe racialized beliefs in children. These objects can offer us rich, complex narratives. They can speak to us, but when placed as an afterthought in American history, what are we really saying? Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much to Dorian and Caroline for those really great presentations. I'm hoping that my light corrects in a minute. Hopefully it will. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And I did learn an odd screen sharing tip very recently. So <laughs> bear with me for one second. All right, that looks good. So yeah, my name is Lyric Lott. Um, as was said earlier, I'm the current Lois McNeil Fellow uh, at Winterthur in their culture program. And today I'm going to be talking about clan robes in the exhibit context. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit of a content warning. Um, in this presentation, I will be showing images of real clan robes. Uh, all of the clan robes that are depicted are real except for one, which is a reproduction. And all of the robes depicted are in an exhibition or an archival context, and none of the robes are depicted being worn by anyone. Nevertheless, these images might be discomforting or distressing to some viewers, and I'm going to talk later on about how that is a very common reaction to actually have. And in the meantime, just please be advised of these images and their content. So next slide does have a robe on it, so I'll take a moment if anyone wants to tap out. Okay. So I wanna start with a little bit of a background on how I came to this project. So in the fall of 2016 at the Lidfield Historical Society in Western Connecticut, <clears throat> I attended a public event titled Uncomfortable Collections. And this robe that you see here, was one of the objects that they had on display. In this um, event, they 
Dorian, you're not muted. One hundred percent. No worries. Um, in this event, they had objects on display that they brought out from their collections that they don't usually display. And this was one of them. And they explained that they don't display this object because they felt that it would be distressing or cause discomfort to their visitors. And as a high school student at the time, I assumed that this was a standard method of display for museums. I assumed that if you had clan robes, you just didn't display them because this is what this museum did. But several years later in 2019, as a intern at the Connecticut Historical Society, I encountered this robe, which was in a traveling exhibition from the New York Historical Society in a exhibition about um, the history of uh, Black people receiving the vote in the United States. And I was immediately struck by how different these two methods of display were, that one museum was very reticent to display their robe and another was totally fine with it. And so today I want to talk a little bit more about the role that these objects play in museum spaces and understand a little bit more about how they function historically and how they function today. So the KKK emerged in the United States following the emancipation of enslaved Black people in the 1860s, a time when these people had suddenly possessed more liberties and freedom of movement in American society. And the organization saw a massive increase in membership in the 1920s following the release of the silent film Birth of a Nation, which depicts Klansmen as defenders of traditional American or rather white nationalist values. And most robes in museums today seem to date to this time of increased membership in the 20s, though some that I've found were made and worn as recently as the 1990s. And most institutions only began to accession clan robes in the 60s and 70s when white Americans began to discover the objects in their attics or their basements, frequently after the death of a parent or grandparent who had been a member of the clan in the 20s, either to the knowledge or the ignorance of the donor. And for one reason or another, many of these people proceeded to donate these items to local museums and historical societies where they've remained up until today. So this map shows the widespread nature of clan robes in museums today. They can be found all across archives in the United States. And this is about two dozen examples that I was able to find. And there's a few important things to note from looking at this map. One is that these robes are not limited to Southern museums. There is both a popular and an academic tendency to equate the KKK with the South, but the reality is that the organization existed and unfortunately continues to exist all across the US, and thus museums all around the country have inherited these objects. And this issue is not limited to larger museums. Most of the dots on this map represent smaller, community-oriented museums rather than larger institutions. And finally, the majority of museums on this map currently display their clan robes for public view. So the manner of displaying these objects within museums does not really vary by institution. <clears throat> They're usually displayed on mannequins to give the impression of a silhouette, which is standard museum practice for historic garments. And they're displayed often on level with the viewer or even higher. And you can see that in this robe depicted here from the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, it's because it's sort of slightly elevated off the ground on the mannequin that it's on. <clears throat> but some people believe that museums should not be displaying clan robes at all. Some scholars believe that the histories and ideologies these objects represent are far too recent and painful to put on display. And they argue that displaying them could pose harm to the well being of members of groups targeted by the KKK, most especially Black Americans, as well as other people of color, religious minorities like Jewish people, and members of the LGBTQ community. So when the South Dakota, excuse me, South Dakota Cultural Heritage Center put this clan robe on display in 2005, local formal civil rights advocate Dorothy Butler described it as an unacceptable glorification of the costume of a terrorist organization. And this viewpoint is not an uncommon one. For many, displaying clan robes rides the line between what scholar Catherine Leonard describes as preserving objects and preserving ideology. 
Knowing these concerns, some museums that own clan robes choose not to display them at all, opting instead to just preserve them in closed storage. And the Black Archives of Mid-America in Kansas City, Missouri is one of these institutions. The museum owns a clan robe that's covered with dark rust colored stains that are possibly blood, and they elect to keep the garment off display. According to the Kansas City Star, the museum declines to display the object in an effort to preserve all aspects of history while at the same time not glorifying or promoting the negative aspects. And Aaron Thompson, an art historian at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, argues that such refusal of display are representative of the emotional impact that seeing reminders of oppression has on people of color, stating that what had been thought of as a merely educational display is now recognized as something that can reopen traumas. On the other hand, there are many people who argue that clan robes should absolutely be displayed in museums. Supporters of their exhibition often cite the responsibility that museum curators have to educate the public on the darker aspects of American history. And one proponent of displaying these difficult stories is Catherine Leonard, a Boston University fellow and a specialist of clan material culture. When discussing the curator's choice to display clan robes at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, Leonard stated that while viewing these objects might generate traumatic feelings, it's important for the country to confront the ways in which violence is constructed and has been constructed towards Black bodies in the United States. However, Leonard also acknowledges the problems displaying these robes can pose, specifically in their recognizability. She states that after a century of circulating in a range of media, Plan robes are self-apparent, and for that reason, they continue to be dangerous cultural symbols that reproduce the violent threat to viewers that their creators intended. In other words, museums may be unknowingly perpetrating plan motives of inciting fear and intolerance in their displays, because as Leonard aptly states, white robes can be read from a distance in a way that discursive labels cannot. One museum that does choose to display their clan robes is the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia in Big, Big Rapids, Michigan. The museum displays objects relating to racial oppression and segregation, including racist advertisements, photos of minstrel actors in blackface, and of course, several clan robes, which you can see here. The objects the museum displays are viscerally uncomfortable to view, which according to David Pilgrim, the museum's curator and founder, is largely the point of the institution. Pilgrim argues that discomfort is a necessary aspect of learning about history, stating the hedonistic desire to avoid pain or anything uncomfortable is counter to our method of directly confronting the ugly legacy of racism. Let's stop talking about it is a plea for comfort, a comfort denied to black Americans and other minorities. So from these examples, it's clear that scholarly views on displaying these objects vary quite widely. But what exactly do the people visiting these collections think? And how do patrons of these museums react to exhibited clan robes? To try to answer these questions, I decided to turn to a rather unconventional source base, <laughs> that of on public online reviews. And for my source bases, I selected top posts from TripAdvisor and Twitter, as both offer advanced search capabilities and consist of entirely publicly available posts and reviews. This is of course not exactly a super scientific approach, but I was able to glean some insightful information from the posts that I could find. Many of the responses I found included descriptions of the visceral emotions and feelings experienced by visitors when encountering clan robes and collections many of them reporting the sensation of getting chills or feeling uneasy. And one poster specifically identifies how the robes incited fear in them because of their identity, stating, I just want people to know that even today, these things still affect us, the black community. Other visitors describe how encountering clan robes made them want to return to museums. One reviewer writes that a displayed robe created an educational moment for their son and that they would thus be returning to the museum to learn more at a later date. Conversely, some visitors report how the presence of clan robes caused them to leave museums or even avoid certain ex exhibitions entirely. And in these instances, the presence of these objects barred visitors from educational experiences rather than encouraged them. 
Yet there are also those who report how encountering groves acted as conversation starters for them and their family and friends. One Smithsonian visitor writes how, though encountering clan robes was an emotionally intense experience for their 11-year-old son, they used it as an opportunity to communicate with him, even after leaving the museum and returning home. In these cases, these encounters acted as catalysts for larger discussions around America's turbulent racial history that visitors might not have otherwise had. So it's universally acknowledged that between curators, scholars, and visitors alike, Clan robes incite discomfort in museums. And curatorial decisions on whether to display them or not hinge on the belief of if this discomfort is positive or negative in its effect. And visitor responses vary greatly from encounter to encounter. Critics of clan robe display see this discomfort as a harmful form of re-traumatization that inhibits education, while proponents see it as something that must be reckoned with and pushed through in order to, in the quest for deeper learning. And it's hard to talk about discomfort around clan robes without acknowledging that these objects impact different demographics in different ways. The impact of clan robes in museums appears understandably to be more severe for visitors belonging to demographics historically targeted by the KKK. And this is a vi vitally important component to note, especially as museums continue to see markedly few patrons of African-American descent, as well as for many other minority groups. And in many ways, this reality shows that the question of discomfort in the exhibit space is political. Who should be uncomfortable in museums? Who should be comfortable? Are there ways to engineer this? These are all questions that museums must ask in order to better serve their staff and visitors. So I'd like to conclude with this piece. This object is a stained glass rosette shard from the 16th Street Baptist Church where one of the most infamous acts of violence by the KKK took place in 1963. On September 15th at 10.22 a.m., a bomb exploded in the historic church, killing four young Black girls attending Sunday school and injuring more than 20 other members of the congregation. This object is not a, place, a piece of Klan iconography, but it still provides the Smithsonian visitors with a tangible representation of the painful history of Klan violence. But I'd like to ask you, in your eyes, how might this object educate visitors of the Smithsonian differently than their displayed Klan robes? Is this piece more insightful than the robes that you've seen here today, or is it less so? And what is lost by studying objects from this history that lack Klan iconography? or possibly more importantly, what is gained. I don't have a concise argument for whether or not these objects should be in museums or a neatly wrapped up solution for what their custodial care should look like. And to be frank, I personally still struggle with whether the educational value of these objects truly outweighs the harm they're capable of doing. And I'm not sure it's really my place to present clear cut answers to these questions. But I do encourage you to take these stories and lessons with you on your own next museum visit. The objects that populate museum collections can be messy and complicated, and our relationships with them as humans even more so. And in the words of the University of Delaware's own Latanya S. Autry, museums are not neutral. And as museum professionals, scholars, and visitors, this is a fact that we must grapple with every time we set foot in a cultural institution. Thank you. All right, Caroline, Lyric, Dorian, thank you so much for your insightful presentations. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hope Elizabeth Gillespie, and I am the Editor-in-Chief, and along with Sydney and Mary-Kate, I am one of the co-founders of CMSMC. CMSMC and History Should Make You Uncomfortable are honestly two parts of the same coin. History Should Make You Uncomfortable was the first idea that we had when we created CMSMC and therefore is something that is particularly important to us, our mission, and our quest to help those young scholars, just like everyone who presented today. In our original symposium, we had 10 speakers, as well as a keynote. Those 10 speakers have gone on to define us, and today I'm very excited to welcome back two of those speakers in a retrospective to talk about their original presentations. Christine Staten 
had an original presentation called Reconsidering Curating Heritage Value, Palazzo Strozzi and Florence, and she will now give a brief overview. Following that, Logan Ward will give a brief overview of his previous presentation, Colonial Connections, Japanese and Western Orientalisms as Hermeneutics for Korean Material Culture at the Cleveland Museum of Art, 1910 to 1945. Christine, take it away. Hi, I'm Christine. Um, this is Madonna, who's climbing uh, <laughs> for me right now. Excuse me, I can't get her down from my desk. Um, so I had the the wonderful opportunity to speak. At, hang on, <laughs> to speak at the inaugural um, symposium when I was a graduate student at Syracuse University, and I presented on a paper that I had written actually as an undergraduate. Um, and had continued to work on and, and mess with through my graduate studies. And come on, honey. It was uh, written when I was an undergraduate studying in Florence, Italy. And I was looking into the history of adaptive reuse of buildings of Renaissance uh, palaces throughout the city of Florence. And I picked the Palazzo Strozzi because it was a very successful um, exhibition venue. They don't actually have a permanent collection, but they are always um, having different exhibitions there. And it really didn't take long to realize that the history of the foundation of the museum was inherently tied to the fascist government of Italy at the time. I mean, the first exhibition was held between April and October of 1940, which was the earliest years of the Second World War at the time when Italy was fighting in the Axis powers, um, long before their switch to the Allies. And it was during a time where Italian cultural heritage was actually being developed through the myths of Romanità and Italianità. Uh, um, and when the very ideas of the Renaissance that we still consider today were actually being formulated. And really all I had to do was scratch the surface to find this history and compare that to what the public information that the museum provided was. And that was um, primarily on the museum's website and just by walking around the space and looking at the didactic material. And even when you go into the uh, exhibition history of the uh, of the, of this of the space, it stops or it starts and stops in the the fifties or sixties. It doesn't mention the nineteen forty exhibition whatsoever, and that was a that set off alarm bells in in my brain, and it led to this discussion of okay, if we have this uncomfortable history, how do we then reconcile that um, as we as we go forward and develop a more contemporary institution and. It was a really interesting exercise as an undergraduate to to dig into that. I was also not only was an I uh, an art historian in training, but I was a cultural heritage specialist in training as well. And it was a nice blend of all the different things that I was that I was interested in. Um, and as years have passed, um, my ideas of what it means for history to make you uncomfortable have have certainly certainly not not changed but expanded um and really the main thing that has affected that is that i've started teaching and i've started teaching at the college level art appreciation at first and now i'm teaching art history and a lot of my students especially if they take art appreciation it's their first time encountering art art history sometimes even just world history in general and that is an enormous privilege and an enormous responsibility and it informs how I walk into my classroom every single day. And one of the first things we discuss is that art, art history and history in general um, are inherently human. And that's where the discomfort comes in, in my opinion, is that when we talk about art, we talk about art history, we are talking about the decisions and the actions and the behaviors of humans, and that's not something that is easy, easily explained or reconciled with. And that makes studying material culture, studying art, and studying history one of the greatest exercises in empathy that we can do. And it takes understanding that people are across times and across the world just making the best choices that they can, or hopefully we can trust in the fact that they make 
the choices that they believe are best at the time. And that demands of the historian to remove themselves from the equation, to remove their judgments, to remove their perspective on things, because you're dealing with people. And that's really hard to do. Um, and it's a really um, difficult thing to bring into a classroom and to, and to describe. But as a historian, I have the privilege of temporal distance. So when we talk about things that happened in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, it's a little bit easier to remove yourself. But it's when we get closer and closer to our, old, our own times or when we're reconciling with things like the Palazzo Strozzi, how do we deal with this in our own time? Um, it becomes slightly even more uncomfortable. Um, but as the, the Holland Carter quote that Caroline was so, was so great to bring in, art is us at our best and at our worst. And it's always important to remember that, that although makers and just people in general are responding to their social history, and we, with the privilege of temporal distance, can see that more clearly, we can see, okay, what was happening in their time and how did they respond to that? Although they respond to that social history, they're not always alertly aware that they do so. And I think what makes me uncomfortable is applying that to not only things that happened in the early modern period, but things that are happening today in the 21st century. Um, so of course, that is not a complete explanation, but it's what I've been ruminating on as um, as I prepared for this re uh, retrospective. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, should I throw it over to Logan now, Hope? Yes, please, Logan. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to CMSMC. Thank you, Hope, Mary Kate, and Sydney for inviting me to provide some self-reflection and retrospection to our discussion today on the topic of history should make you uncomfortable. My name is Logan Ward and my pronouns are he or they. I am this semester finally a PhD student in art history at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. And I study and teach art and visual culture in and from Korea. I am also an editor for CMSMC and I have been since 2021. I tune in with you all from the ancestral homelands and or the displaced homes of the Ka, Osage, Shawnee, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, and Iowa peoples who continue as the indigenous caretakers of this land. I am originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I lived in Columbus, Ohio while attending the Ohio State University until 2021. And I also lived in Seoul, the capital of South Korea for a semester as an exchange student and I returned one other instance during this time. I share my place history to indicate my personal basis for my research and teaching, which is heavily determined by my experiences in different places at specific times and questions that arose not only to myself, but to my companions um, while in and at those places. So today we have heard much about the role of art, visual and material culture perpetuating systems of oppression against groups of people based on gender, sex, and race particularly, and much about what museums are doing, can be doing, or should be doing to illuminate this history while combating these systems of oppression that these um, things upheld or continue to uphold. And I similarly came to CMSMC with these concerns, and after, because I had been working at the Columbus Museum of Art, which is a very um, visitor-centered and education-focused museum with a huge um, focus on social equity and social justice. And I had at the same time been visiting museums in both the United States and South Korea in which art from Korea is curated, exhibited, and interpreted. I had noticed that across national boundaries, Art from Korea was consistently represented primarily by pre-1900 ceramics, and especially Korea period, um, which is like really early, 13, like 1000 to 1300. Uh, blue green glazed ceramics, also known as celadon in English and most European languages. I was particularly concerned about the narrative of Korea that persisted in these places, no matter their national location which emphasized such interpretations as Korean uniqueness, Korean beauty, Korean masterpieces, Korean craftsmanship. And these 
narr this narrative rarely invited visitors or viewers to engage with these artworks or objects beyond transmitting this kind of interpretation. This was curious to me, particularly in the United States, um, because I also noticed that most objects had accession numbers with years between 1910 and 1945, the period during which Korea was under Japanese colonial rule. So thus were born the questions that inspired my presentation for the 2020 History Should Make Your Own Comfortable Symposium with SMC. Why were most objects from Korea in the US acquired during the Japanese colonial period? Why were they primarily ceramics? And why were museums so preoccupied with the question of Koreanness? My presentation, then titled Double Orientalizing Korea, the Warner Sakleva Museum of Art and Japanese Colonialism, explore the ways that two early 20th century Euro-American Orientalists, Langdon Warner and Lorraine Warner, laid the foundations for collecting and interpreting Korean art at the Cleveland Museum of Art by transferring Japanese colonial interpretations of what was good Korean art based on what times and places in Korean history that Japanese colonial scholars on Korea viewed as good. They did this while actively learning about Korean art in Japanese colonial archeological surveys and museum projects in Korea during the 1910s. Thus, Korea in the early 20th century museum of the United States became both the imagined Wests and Japan's orientalized other, benefiting from the modernized yet oriental empire of Japan's civilizing mission in Korea. Japan knew what was best for and about Korea, and museums in the US accepted this assumption, both in collecting and interpreting material culture from Korea. This served as the basis for my MA thesis titled Colonial Connections, Interpreting and Representing Korean Korea Through Art and Material Culture at the Cleveland Museum of Art, 1914 to 1945. So now I'm not really doing any research that is direct, directly related to this. Um, so my idea of history should make you uncomfortable has definitely been changing. And actually, Christine, you took the words right out of my mouth. It is because of teaching, finally being able to teach, um, which is something that's awarded, it's awarded to um, typically to PhD students, especially. And um, that has made me rethink my approach to what my research should be about. Particularly, I have shifted from pure critique um, to actually actively trying to imagine what we can be doing that's different, that is both highlighting these uncomfortable aspects of history and also trying to create a present and a future that rejects the systematic, those systems of oppression that allowed for these uncomfortable aspects of history to occur and persist to, to today. And I really also, the word I use, like Christine said, is empathy. For me, I, you know, I don't think empathy is the only thing that we need in this world um, and is not going to bring about the active change necessarily that we need. Um, in museums and in our societies and globally today. But I do think it's a stepping stone and I think it's an important stepping stone that historians and art historians and museum professionals, um, material culturalists, visual culturalists, it's an important thing that we have access to bringing and helping others develop because we work with history and we work with narrative, we work with interpretation. And so for me, that's what my work um, recently, um, not necessarily my research, but my teaching has been a lot about is trying to develop that sense of empathy. And I think that's what really leads to major changes in the political sphere, in the social sphere, and that's why I continue to deal with, and I want to continue to deal with the idea of history making me uncomfortable because it helps me um, empathize with, in ways that I, with, with ideas and experiences that I never even would consider due to my own position as, um, as a white man, as a white non-binary masculine, 
uh, person. And so that's to me what history making you uncomfortable is all about, is learning these new ways of being and understanding them. So thank you very much everyone for being here today. And I appreciate uh, all the time that the speakers have taken to discuss with us their amazing work. So thank you very much. All right, everyone, all of our speakers and our two friends from our retrospective are going to turn on their cameras and be available now for the Q&A portion. Um, just a quick housekeeping note for questions, please drop them in the Q&A box down here and we will get to them. But my first question is very general and it is for all of you. And Logan and Christine, you have very much answered this and you have answered this question before. So I'm going to let Dorian, Lyric and Caroline jump in. But the three of you all had very different but very complimenting presentations on history should make you uncomfortable. But to you personally, as a student, as a teacher, and as a person, what does history should make you uncomfortable mean to you? Whoever is ready to jump in, just go. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually have a little issue with the phrase, I think. I, I've been puzzling over should, um, because I don't want history to make anyone uncomfortable. I don't want it to be, I don't want uncomfortable things to have happened in history. It's not should feels like I'm celebrating it. And I'm not. I think history will make you uncomfortable because history is complex and often terrible. But I wish it didn't have to. I'm sorry. I know I already answered this question, but I just want to jump and support you, Dorian, and say, yes, I actually say all the time history is uncomfortable or history will make you uncomfortable and we should embrace it. I'm going to chime in also uh, and say, I yeah, I largely agree with what Dorian said. I think that um, it is important to acknowledge, yeah, like history is going to make you uncomfortable, like Christine was saying, um, especially since I think that the phrase can be co-opted to be used to justify maybe things that aren't okay happening in classroom environments or in other educational environments and saying, well, if you're uncomfortable, you're supposed to be when maybe that uncomfortable is creating problems that are preventing people from being, being able to have discussions and being able to learn in a safe environment. I think for me, um, the idea that history would make you uncomfortable sort of encompasses looking at all sides of a situation, you know, bringing in the good and the bad together for a holistic view of whatever it is you're studying. And you guys just set it up perfectly for the next question, but go ahead. Logan. Oh, yes. Um, I like this, um, this idea of should, what does the should indicate? Because for me, I, I absolutely agree. History is uncomfortable and history will make you uncomfortable. But I always took the should there as a um, call toward this idea that history is, you know, something out there that we're supposed to grab as historians or people who are trying to work with history and then present to everyone. And that's just what it is. When in reality, that's not it at all, right? We are actively writing history. History is our present understanding of the past. And the should there for me, which I agree is problematic, was more of um, trying to indicate that like we should, as people who are in the present trying to understand the past. We should be looking for the uncomfortable moments and bringing those to light and discussing them for our own um, so that we can learn from them. So I would say, you know, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate or anything, but for me, that's the way I look at this particular phrase, but I do agree. I think, I don't think that we should be actively making people uncomfortable with history or, um, but I think we, I think you can't help it at the same time. And I think that that is uh, something that really translates well for all of us, right? Because we're not only all students, but a lot of us are also teachers. And even as students and as, you know, members of a cohort, what responsibility do we have in a classroom, in a class discussion, in a symposium to create a safe learning environment while also 
embracing discomfort. And I would like all of you to kind of discuss that. And Logan and Christine, if you could start, because you both do teach. So, and you've both hit on that as well. And, and as someone who works with children, that's particularly difficult for me because what is a level of discomfort for children? But it's the same thing with people of college age. Yes, yes. And it's the, it's that balance of, of, okay, does, 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 does uncomfort mean, uncomfortable mean unsafe? And no, it doesn't. Um, we have a, you know, a policy in my, in my classroom where, you know, I tell them, we're going to look at things that are going to make you uncomfortable. And I encourage you to try to sit in that and try to challenge yourself because that's where learning happens and growth happens. But I don't want you to sit in my classroom and feel unsafe and not trust me anymore as your professor, because it's an enormous responsibility to be up there and be like, hi, I'm the authority and I know what I'm talking about. Right. So there's an understanding that if you ever need to excuse yourself and take care of yourself and come talk to me, we can, we can do that. Um, but my role is to make those uncomfortable situations. I mean, we just had one last week, we were talking about ancient Egypt and we were talking about the marriage within the family, you know, and everyone was very interested in that and kept asking questions that I didn't really have answers for and seemed really grossed out. And um, I had to just push it and say, this is how they did it. And this is how it has continued for a long time. And I gave examples of Victoria and Albert being first first cousins and uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip being third or fourth cousins, whatever they were, right? And how reminding them that these ideas that make us uncomfortable aren't really all that removed from our current culture and things like that. Um, but sometimes it's a balance between do I let them sit in that discomfort or do I try to pull them out of it a little bit and it just depends on reading your room and reading your um reading your material Logan do you have a similar experience I do I think one thing um that one dis discrepancy that you made which is really important is the difference between being uncomfortable and being unsafe and I mean as a teacher as a, as a person um who's the leader in a room your number one goal should always be everyone's safety. And um, it, it is very, you know, it, it's very dependent on, on the topic, on the content, um, what counts as uncomfortable, what counts as unsafe. For me, you know, as weird as it is, making students uncomfortable um, in my classroom really means challenging them to think about things they never thought about before which sounds really basic and like, well, yeah, you should be doing that in a classroom, but honestly you don't, not a lot. Um, and we don't really realize that until, you know, we've been told, oh, well, this is, you know, one of the things we wanna do is we wanna, we, we wanna think in new ways and challenging students to value that, that kind of learning, especially, um, and that way of approaching history um, whether it be material culture, visual culture, art, whatever, um, uh, engendering in students the desire to, to want to ask a question, to critically think, and to ask also, look for the exclusions in history. That's what's really important, um, which is a very hard skill to develop, but asking what is not here and looking going to look for it um so you know I, I think that for me is what is uncomfortable um for students particularly because it's a new thing for them um and you know I find in, in the courses that I teach we talk about colonialism we talk about military dictatorships and we talk about um democratization movements the murder of of children, you know, all these things. I mean, that's horrible, but I mean, we talk about it, right? And you see it, you see it in art, in the visual culture. I mean, it's there, right? You can't ignore it when you're looking at this, uh, whether it's a painting or something. So um, for me, I, I would say um, the, 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 I don't know, is there a difference between, I'm also thinking, is there a difference between uncomfort and discomfort as well? Um, but, that, I guess that's another thing, so. 
Yeah, that, that that's for me the the that's what's uncomfortable. Moving from like the classroom to like, for instance, an exhibit space, which is still a very educationally oriented space. But I think that the, I guess the rules are different. Um, there's, there's a level of consent in entering a classroom to discuss a subject that is not necessarily present in an exhibit space that you don't know what you're walking into. And I think that's something we have to be very mindful of when we're handling educational spaces. And I think Lyric, you made a really good point about this audience segmentation and who's being made uncomfortable and who we want to like make the difference between an uncomfort that is rooted in questioning your perceived ideas, the things that you don't want to think about because it's easier for you to not think about it in your life and the kind of uncomfort that is born from re-traumatization that is born from, I know about this stuff, but I, I wish I didn't have to experience it right now in this public space. Um, that is hugely different. Those are different emotions. And I think we are much more interested in creating one than the other. So I think that was a really great point. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I, um, it was something that I definitely wanted to get across <laughs> because I think it's a very important point, but it is very complicated, um, especially when we're dealing with you know, I mentioned that a lot of these museums are smaller museums or very small, like historical societies or uh, like local institutions. And a lot of them have maybe staffs of like three people. Uh, and maybe they don't exactly have the training to understand. And also with the added layer of many of these institutions are run by white people because there is very much a sort of slanted, um, you know, percentage of like the racial balance in museum institutions is very unbalanced. Um, and so all of these things add up to create these uncomfortable situations. Uh, and it's so hard to like immediately try to present a solution for that because again, like these places are very complicated and they are, you know, it's going to take a long time, I think, before we get there. But I think that, like, having these conversations is a really important part of that and raising awareness about, like, hey, these are things that maybe you should be thinking about in your own institution. Caroline, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I would just say that I think like Lyric said, there is not a good solution right now. And I think we're still in the process of figuring that out. I really liked what Christine said about um, challenging yourself and challenging the beliefs that you currently hold. I think for me, that's what um, this study is about is, you know, reading one thing and changing my beliefs in one way and then reading another and changing it again. So um, I think there's value to the discomfort, but again, there's no like set path right now. So when we're dealing more with the general public, um, I know that several of us are in museum study programs or in material culture programs, several of us work for museums. Um, I personally work for a science center. How should museums and science centers and cultural institutions handle discomfort? Because there are people between the ages of six months old and 95 that I deal with on a daily basis. They come from different backgrounds. They come from, you know, different life experiences. They, they, they are all across the spectrum when it comes to what they're bringing into a space. So how do we as cultural institutions make that space uncomfortable in a productive and safe manner? What are your thoughts on that? I have pretty strong feelings about this. Um, I think as, there's some tenets that I really believe in. One is relevancy. The material you're showing, are you making sure that it is absolutely relevant, illustrative of the points you are trying to make in your exhibit? Because if so, that's good. But if it's just there because you have it and it's related tangentially to the points you're making, like it's also racist, then putting it on display is to some degree irresponsible. A second point, I really believe in the very specific trigger warning, not, not the trigger warning that says trigger warning and nothing else, but the, this exhibit will include these things. 
Um, because I think even if some people say, hey, that's not for me, I think that it is, it is worth potentially losing that audience in order to get good faith engagement um, and to not surprise anyone with something traumatizing. And then the third thing I really believe in is um, if an exhibit is just, where are you putting, where are you putting these objects? Because if an exhibit is a paid additional experience to entry, then you have a very good opportunity to say, hey, this one's going to be intense. This is what this thing is going to be. Or even if it's just a separate exhibit in another room, you have an opportunity to say, hey, this is going to be intense. This is what this is going to be. And like the classroom setting, to a certain degree, a visitor can then sign up for that, sign up to have those conversations. But if it's just in the midst of your general exhibit, there's a section on racism or a section on gender inequality that produces traumatizing images, I, you have to be so careful about just that being smacked in the middle of an otherwise unrelated exhibit. Uh, going off of that, I think it's important to involve the public in the decisions you're making, talking to the communities who are, you are representing in your museums about how they want to see, you know, um, dis uncomfortable artifacts interpreted, um, making sure their voices are heard and respected in your museum space. You know, so again, I don't, um, you know, I don't want anyone to feel unsafe. I don't want anyone to relive trauma, but there is always this part of me that's kind of like, would the person who's coming to the exhibition, coming to an exhibition, coming to the museum, who is the person who needs to have this kind of experience with this kind of story, you know, with something like, not necessarily trigger warnings, but, you know, just like allowing them to know about it, I guess is important, right? But then at the same time, I'm kind of like, well, that person might then avoid it for some reason, you know? And this is so, this is completely hypothetical, but I'm just saying, this is something I think about because, you know, in a way when I, when people come to the museum as, as someone who, or people come to my classroom, come to my museum, sometimes I, I kind of want them to be offended. And I know that's really controversial and I don't really care because you need to be offended about certain things sometimes. Um, you know, if you're someone who, who thinks um, that, you know, blackface is okay, like if we were talking about, or, you know, that Klansman robes don't hurt people in some way, right? Or that an image of, a, of, of someone's, you know, um, genitalia is, is, is inappropriate. Then I kind of want, I kind of want you to see that and, or, or not, or not see this context so that you can understand why I, you, you, you can understand the other, the other point of view, I guess. So I, in a way, I, it is, it, I guess I'll just say, cause I'm not really a museum professional anymore anyways, but I will say, um, I think there is a value to, to wanting people to be uncomfortable and kind of masking it, that there is something uncomfortable about the exhibition it's a really hard line to walk and you know you're going to offend people no matter what so who cares <laughs> yeah i i have to agree with that as someone who manages floor staff you know my job is training in museum interpretation um there are people who want to come in and they they actively want to be offended and it is never our intention to do that you know we we want to engage like we're just, that's that's what they're there for right but it does call into question and Logan this is where I mildly disagree with you of safety for the people who are presenting the information like it at, at some point I don't care about the objects anymore and I say that as an archaeologist I'll get my card taken away for saying that I'm sure but at some point I care more about my floor staff and the interpretation that they're doing and their safety than I do about what objects we're displaying because I think at some point you can beat someone over the head with something so much that they don't listen anymore. They don't want to engage with it anymore. And no matter what you do, they're not going to. So while I'm all for people being mildly offended, I, I don't know that I agree with 
a total and complete eclipse of offense. But Dorian, go ahead and say what you were going to say. I I totally agree with Logan that you run the risk of the people, the people you want to be offended. We were talking right audience segmentation with Lyric. The people you want to be offended turning the other way and being like, mm, I'm not interested in having my beliefs challenged. You don't want that to happen. We're sort of in the business of opening minds. And so that would suck. But I think that when we make those considerations, so much of museum content is built, and this is true of all marketing, but it's built around a white male audience. We're not thinking about the people of color in that space who are experiencing their own histories being represented to them. We're thinking about the, the like stock white person who is racist, who we're gonna change the mind of. And I'd love to do that work, but I think we sometimes over prioritize that perspective and changing that perspective over the comfort of the people who feel statistically feel unwelcome in museum spaces already. Yeah, I think that that is a very important point to make. And again, it kind of ties into the idea of like, who exactly are museums for? And like, who is your exhibit geared towards? And what are the sort of feelings that you're trying to elicit from your guests? I know that, um, I mean, like content warnings or trigger warnings have been mentioned several times. Uh, and I do know that the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC, they do have a sort of content warning system that was mentioned in one of the reviews that I showed, um, but I didn't have time to talk about it. But it's this sort of red box system is what the reviewer called it, where basically um, exhibitions or objects or like photos that are sort of marked as sensitive material or like you know, could possibly be triggering material are marked with a red box around it so that people know that that is, you know, it's there before they encounter it. But I also did see a lot of people online saying that it's largely ineffective. And like, by the time that you see the box or by the time that you see the red text or whatever, you've already basically seen the object or the image that, you know, they were trying to allow you to avoid. So I think obviously there needs to be steps and strides as far as the efficacy of those things. But also I think that content warnings and things are very important things to have in museum spaces. And I think that they enable a lot of interpretation that maybe wouldn't have otherwise been able to happen. Like, and it is true of uh, what Logan mentioned earlier of maybe someone is just going to avoid that part entirely because they don't want to have that sort of experience that day or engage with that material. And that's something that did happen in that review of that person said that they deliberately went past those red boxed exhibits to go to the more like uplifting exhibits about like Obama and like, yay, we're not racist anymore, which is obviously not what those exhibitions are about, but they're more uplifting in their sense. Um, and I think that it's important to understand that, but it's also important to think about, you know, you have people coming into this museum who maybe grew up in the 60s and maybe someone in their community was lynched. And so seeing images of lynching can be very re-traumatizing. Like this is not an old history. It's something that's very recent, obviously, like we have all lived through 2020. Um, and so these are things that are still very fresh in people's minds. And so not having anything at all, I think is very dangerous in like, you know, interpretive strategies. That was a very long winded comment, but. <laughs> if I could just, um, I love all, I love this discussion. I think everybody's making super, super, super valid points. And I would like to add to it that we've kind of been skirting around what is the role of the learner? What is the role of the visitor? to the museum and the role of the student in the classroom. And something that I try to either illicitly or explicitly or implicitly instill in my students is don't go into situations uninformed. Don't go into your assignments uninformed. Don't walk into the museum space uninformed. And for the first time visitor to a museum, that's not something they think about. Oh, I'm, I'm, I live in the Philadelphia area. Oh, I've never been to the PMA. Let's go and have a great time. And then maybe they have, they, they don't know the, they don't have the tools to walk into that situation, but as they continue to do that, hopefully they have a wonderful experience at the museum and they can make that part of their life. Visiting museums, um, we have responsibilities as learners and students and museum visitors to kind of do our due diligence and see, okay, what am I going into? 
there is an exhibition here that's called or I'm walking into a museum that is the, what is it? The Museum of Racist Memor Memorabil Memorabilia. All right, what am I going to see today? Maybe I should prepare myself for that space I'm about to walk into, right? Or um, just just being a conscious visitor and being being an informed visitor and and, and taking a couple of steps before, before you walk into that space. I totally agree. And I would love to continue to have this conversation because I know we all have lots of thoughts, but there are a few uh, audience questions I do want to get to. Um, Caroline, the first one is for you. Um, how do you define transgressive? Sure. So for in the context of this paper, I would say transgression really refers to um, breaking of the social norms. So at the time, you know, the way that uh, the figure is painted in the origin of the world, um, it's breaking tradition as far as like classical, you know, how nudes are painted. Um, it is sort of subverting those ideals about what art should look like. And I think in a way that also is uncomfortable for people um, to be faced with something that's different and goes, you know, outside of the norm and almost is a, a ta taboo almost. Um, so for me, transgression really refers to that feeling of like something is wrong, I guess. Awesome. Um... All right, Dorian, the next one is for you. Did you find any textile differences in the material used for the skirts in the dolls? I'm wondering if the cloth either enforced or inadvertently challenged the user experience of engaging with the dolls. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think um, it's important to note that the skirt is one piece of fabric that is reversible. So it's the same on both sides, but it is just one piece of fabric. So it's the same piece of fabric. And also both aprons are made out of the same fabric. Um, the major difference is in the like torso, uh, the, I guess, what do you call that part of the, just the top, let's say the shirt, um, in, in the sense that one is the same fabric as the skirt, the white girl, uh, little girl's dress is the same. It's a dress clearly versus the black little girl's top is different than the skirt, which speaks to me of, um, you know, there's stuff in like fashion history about like whether you could afford a combined set, whether you could afford uh, something that was meant to be worn together or if you were separates. And I think that that is reflected here, as well as just the style of the sleeves is reflective of class, the style of the apron top is reflective of class, the bonnet versus bandana is both reflective of uh, racial stereotypes and of class. It's definitely there, but I wouldn't say it's in the fabric. It, the fabric is all the same, made by the same company, um, so much as it is in the, the stylization of how that fabric is depicted. And the last question that we have, um, can the panelists speak to the difference between intention and impact, as well as how content warnings play a role in trying to mitigate negative impact? Takes us back to our previous discussion. Whoever wants to get started, go for it. Okay, I'll uh, give my I, I think, Go ahead, Logan. Oh, I was gonna say, well, I think maybe um, earlier, maybe that's what I was thinking about a little bit. And like you were talking about hope, the negative impact on your staff, which as someone who's been on, been frontline staff, <laughs> I can tell you some stories, um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's why that's one of my issues is um, I, I I struggle with and I'm not saying there's a way to do it again. Um, uh, although I agree with everything, um, the replies to what I was mentioning earlier. And, um, you know, I, I do think that part of the negative impact, like Dorian, you were talking about with the issue of, you know, and Lyric as well, the issue of who is it for, who's the audience and then privileging the, the white male kind of experience and challenging that. I, I wonder if the negative impact um, that museums talk about broadly and classrooms talk about broadly as well, is also is, it's all based on, on that ideal, which is in itself um, a, which is in itself a very, it's it's a very racist, Eurocentric, you know, white supremacist, whatever whatever word you want to use for it, notion, right? So I think that's why I struggle struggle with it a lot. I don't have an answer to it. 
Um, although I will say just personally, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with trying to handle or dealing with negative impact. Um, that's just me. I will put up with it. You know, I'm not going to necessarily try and make it right, but I'm more of a um, apologize later kind of person. Um, so I think that kind of attitude is what works for me the best, but. I think insofar as um, the difference between intention and impact, uh, museums have very little control over what people who come to them take away. Um, you have no idea how someone who's walking through your doors is going to react in any given situation. And so whether your intentions are you know, to say like, hey, this is problematic material, that might not be what someone walks away with. Um, and I think like Christine was saying, content warnings help to inform people about what they're walking into. Um, so you can make those choices and um, hopefully take away good things rather than, than bad. Well, the intention of, hopefully, you know, we, we trust in the fact that the intention of an educator or an educational space is to educate and to challenge and to have people walk away with a, with a good experience, right? I think at the end of the day, you want people to come through the doors of your museum and leave having had a nice day, you know, having had a nice day. Um, and you write your content, your, your, your content warnings and your wall text with, with that intention. Hopefully that's always the, yeah, I think we can agree. <laughs> Usually that's, that's the intent, hopefully, right? Um, but you can never predict what the impact is going to be because like we talked about, every visitor, every student is an individual who's going to come into a situation with their own baggage and with their own beliefs. And just speaking from personal experience, sometimes I walk into something and maybe it's a, it's a trigger for me, but I'm having a good day. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm good with that today. Like I'm going to walk away or I'm having a bad day. And that's, that's, that's not a great one. Um, but so it just depends on the individual and, it's, and that's just inherently unpredictable. Um, but the, the role of content warnings, I find are, are slippery slope to say the least, because they are good in that way of, okay, let's make sure our visitor knows what they're going to walk into so that we don't just ruin their day. Right. Um, um, but I, I think they toe the line of being informative, but maybe they could be used for, you know, as, uh, how do I want to put this in a, in a productive way? Um, we're going to put something up that we know are going to upset people, but we're going to put a content warning up so that it's okay, right? We don't want to, what's the word I'm trying to use as a validation for putting up uh, content or just images, something to intentionally make somebody uncomfortable right to to throw that monkey wrench in there like well we're going to put a content warning up so it's okay like to excuse bad exhibition practices or something like this you guys are maybe somebody can help me explain my thought a little bit right yeah it's it's used as is a is liability insurance it's it's used as a way That's what of, I was looking for. Yeah. of presenting something that is known to be uncomfortable is known to incite violence as well we're just telling it like it is which dorian i think is what you mean by our responsibility to being respo our responsibility to being responsible yeah that that's english our responsibility to guests about what we choose to display right so there's something that you said about good faith engagement that i think answers this question very well and if you could expand on that i would very much appreciate it i'm a big believer in if not in the museum space then where right or if not in the classroom then where these are the spaces that we have they're community spaces, but they're also, they're the spaces that we have to unpack these things um, in facilitated ways. And I do, I really feel that that is sort of the ethos of both the classroom and the museum. But you want to make sure that the people walking into your exhibit that is controversial or even troubling, um, that they're walking in not with the intent to you have to think about every visitor in that space, right? There are visitors who walk in and they want to engage. They want to engage with the content. They're interesting. Even if they've got barriers up there, they're still like, well, I'll, I'll hear what they have to say. We'll see if I agree. Um, and then you'll have visitors who come in and they feel completely different or worse. They see a clan robe in a museum and they're like, yeah, my grandpa had one of those uncritically. And that's the kind of experience that a person of color would be standing next to them, hear that and be like, I'm not safe here. 
this is not safe for me. Because clearly this exhibit is not balancing these objects correctly. If someone can walk in and feel heritage when they see this object. And I think that you want, I feel very strongly about museums being clear about this is what we are arguing. I think museums want to claim to not be arguing often, but I feel very strongly about this is what we are arguing. Do you agree? Um, because I think making clear what the historical narrative you are pulling from these objects are is a good way to engage people in good faith to say, here's how we feel about it. What do you think? And there's always going to be people who walk into the exhibit and they take something completely different than what you intended. But I think you're more likely to have people engage with you on the level of, all right, I get what you're saying. Here's how I feel. If you do that work. I find it really interesting that you bring up the point about um, heritage and like specifically like seeing Clan Rose Museums and having that feeling because I uh, just yesterday I read an article that's about Daryl Davis, who is a um, uh, like a rather famous black musician, but he's become even more like renowned because he has started to collect clan robes. And he basically hangs out with members of the KKK and attempts to, you know, through having conversations with them, uh, sort of sway them away from their beliefs. A very interesting person, very interesting guy to read about if you're ever interested. Uh, but the article was about him visiting the Smithsonian, the National Museum of African American History, uh, with a uh, a member of the Klan who was like a grand wizard or something. I, I don't really know a lot about the hierarchy, but, you know, was up there in the standing. Um, and the article was talking about how they were going through the exhibit and sort of talking about the objects on display. And when they got to one of the clan robes that was on display, um, his reaction, the clan member's reaction was like, wow, it's so amazing that this is such a high quality item. It's so old, but you can see like they put so much care into the stitching and basically had this response to it that was probably entirely not what the museum wanted him to have. Uh, and I think that that is an important thing to think about, like you were saying, Dorian. And I think that someone had a question before about like the rosette shard and sort of having it in context and in communication with the clan robe. I think that that would be a great interpretive display because it would be talking about it specifically in the context of the violence created by these people. Um, but as of right now, at least, it is still in this unfortunate gray area where people can walk in and have these responses, which again, how, as a curator, how do you mitigate that? How can you work around that when there, you know, there are so many variables of people who are coming into your exhibition that you just don't know who's coming in? All right. Guys, thank you so much for all of your discussion. Do you guys have, have any last comments that you want to hit on before we wrap up today? Nope. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you again to our wonderful panelists and to Logan and Christine for providing their retrospective. Your research has always been so engaging. And this discussion has really challenged all of us, I think, to think of familiar topics in new ways. And thank you again to everybody who attended the symposium and contributed to our discussion. A recording of the symposium will be available on our website and YouTube channel in the coming weeks. If you'd like to be more involved with CMSMC or support our mission, please consider subscribing to our newsletter, donating through DonorBox, shopping in our online store, and attending more events with us. Information on all of this and more is available on the CMSMC website. As Sydney mentioned earlier, we are putting out a CFP for more papers about history making you uncomfortable. Notice I omitted the should there. Um, if you would like to have your work published, all of the information is additionally on the website and I would love to read all of your work. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>